Verse 45 of Matthew 27, it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This statement is one of the seven words or utterances spoken by our Lord from the cross. It's the fourth of the seven utterances of cross. And it is central. It's interesting that it's the center of the seven words. And it kind of is central in the doctrine that it displays of what Christ did as a substitute taking our sin upon the cross during this time of darkness over the whole land. I believe the cross of Jesus Christ is the central truth and theme of the Bible. That this cry from the cross is the deepest expression of that experience on the cross. C.H. Spurgeon said about this fourth cry, he said, here you may look as into a vast abyss, and though you strain your eyes and gaze till sight fails you, yet you perceive no bottom, it is measureless, unfathomable, and inconceivable. This fourth watcher utterance introduces us to a mystery that our minds can never fully fathom or understand. It may seem kind of crazy that I would pick these verses to talk about this utterance. And we've done a whole series, by the way, on all the seven words of Christ uttered from the cross. You can check it out there on our website. But in this word that we look at tonight, the utterance of agony, there's such a mystery involved in it that even the greatest theological minds have not been able to grasp or understand what is going on in this passage is Jesus Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice in verse 46, it was about the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Jesus cried with a loud voice. Now, in verse 45, it gives us the time frame that from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Now, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, was from 12 noon, high noon, till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But Jesus has been placed on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. So he hung on the cross from 9 a.m. in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And the second half of that time on the cross, there was this darkness that enveloped the land. And Jesus cried these famous words, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, Aramaic, and that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Martin Luther said, God forsaken of God, how can this be? Who can understand this? And the truth is, no one can fully fathom or understand this concept. God forsaken by God, how could this be? Now, there are two simple mysteries that I want to mention here in verse 45 and 46. The first mystery before we look at the mystery of his separation from God the Father, is the mystery of this darkness that enveloped the land when it says from the sixth hour, 12 noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. This was a time of darkness. Now, some try to explain it away by natural occurrences and say it wasn't supernatural, it wasn't the work of God, but it was actually a solar eclipse. But the problem is Jesus died at Passover, and Passover always has a full moon, and we know that they don't have, we don't have solar eclipse during the time of a full moon. So I believe it was a special divine intervention in the normal workings of nature, that this darkness wasn't just some kind of a haphazard occurrence, but that it was directly brought about by God the Father because of what was going on with His Son dying upon the cross that it was a special divine intervention in the normal workings of nature. And it was a darkness, I believe, that was universal. Remember when the people of God were in Egypt and there was a plague of darkness? So God again brings this darkness over the whole land when Jesus there is hanging on the cross for the sins of the world. Now, why did this darkness come? Again, we can't be absolutely sure But let me mention three reasons I find interesting. Number one, that it could be the darkness of sympathy and that in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says all creation is groaning and travailing in pain 
waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Did you know that creation is affected by the fall and under the curse? And that creation is groaning. We're groaning for glory. The Holy Spirit groans for us in prayer. And the Bible says that creation groans. What that means is when Jesus Christ comes back in His second coming, and He comes back to set up His kingdom on earth for a thousand years, that He's going to reverse the curse. I like to think of it, reverse the curse, and He will do away with all this evil in the world, and there will be righteousness and peace cover the earth as waters cover the seas. We are so troubled right now as we watch the news about this war that's going on. And our hearts are troubled. Jesus said, let not your heart be what? Troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, which is heaven, are many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to do what? Prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen? He promised. And guess what? God always keeps His promises. I'll come again and I'll receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So we're, we're looking for the Lord to come again and to establish his righteous kingdom. But until then, creation is groaning. And the reason Paul says in Romans 8 that it's the manifestation of the sons of God is because we'll come back with Christ in our glorified bodies and all those who have rejected Christ will see the church in all its splendor and all its glory and all its redemptive beauty, and they'll realize that they rejected the Savior, Jesus Christ. But up to that point, creation is groaning, but there'll be the manifestation of the sons of God. So this is a time when the creation is showing sympathy for the Creator. Someone said, He hung upon a cross of wood, but He made the hill on which it stood. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. They rejected their own Creator and their own Redeemer. So when Adam sinned, he brought the curse. Then there was also the thorns and the thistles on the ground. And Jesus wore a symbol of that in the crown of thorns as he died for our sin. So the Creator was suffering on the cross and all creation was groaning with him in this time of sympathy of darkness. We sing the song, well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man, the creature's sin. But secondly, this darkness also could be a darkness of silence. Because I find it interesting that during these last three hours, there is no reference to any utterance being made by anyone. Not from the soldiers, not from any at the foot of the cross, not by Jesus. He earlier had said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. But at these last three and a half hours, until he dismissed his spirit, bowed his head and dismissed his spirit, he earlier here he cried with a loud voice, it is finished to tell us die. And then he dismissed his spirit. There was this time of silence. So there was this time of silence where all creation was hushed before this experience on the cross. At the birth of the Son of God, there was brightness at midnight. And at the death of the Son of God, there was darkness at noon. What an interesting contrast. But thirdly, about this darkness mystery, it was the darkness of secrecy. The darkness veiled the anguish of the Son of God while He was bearing the punishment for our sins. It's almost as though God the Father pulled a veil over God the Son. And when the sins of the world were being placed upon Him at that moment, He hid Him in this darkness, shutting Him off from the eyes of a sinful world. Dr. James Boyce said, the darkness cried out against the dark blackness of our sin and testified to the tremendous cost to God for our redemption. Again, Elizabeth Klip, uh, Kipling in a beautiful uh, hymn said, none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere He found His sheep that was lost. So the light of the world dying to save those who are living in darkness. Now, at that moment, that time of that darkness is when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 46, he cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why hast thou 
forsaken me. Now I find it interesting in this second mystery, there's the mystery of the darkness, and then there's the mystery of his being forsaken. I find it interesting that Matthew and Mark are the only two Gospels that make reference to this utterance. They're the only ones that refer to this statement that Jesus made. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's not a cry of anger. It's not a cry of unbelief. Notice he calls him my God, my God. So he still had his faith in his father. But what kind of cry was this cry of agony on the cross? Let me mention some of the spots or aspects of this cry. Number one, it was a cry of separation. It was a cry of separation. The question that needs to be asked is, did the Father actually forsake the Son? Now, I chuckle a little bit because I'm asking a question that I can't be absolutely dogmatic about, though I have my convictions and I'm going to share them with you. I've actually wrestled with this for many, many, many years, and I've had people argue with me about it and debate me on it and try to you know, change my mind. But good conservative evangelical scholarship hold this position that the Father actually, for a moment of time, literally forsook His Son, had to turn His back on His Son. And we'll explain what I mean by that. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? Some say, well, He wasn't really forsaken. He just felt forsaken. It was just this kind of feeling that he felt like, God, why have you forsaken me? But there's no biblical reason to believe that that is the case, that he wasn't forsaken. If Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? We just simply have to take it at face value to conclude that he was forsaken during that moment of time when the father had to turn his back upon his own son. Again, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said there could have been no vicarious suffering on the part of Christ for human guilt if he had not continued, if he had continued consciously to enjoy full, the full sunshine of his Father's presence. Now, the most likely explanation was not that there was a separation of the Godhead. That's the argument. How can you separate God the Father from God the Son from God the Holy Spirit? The Godhead was intact. He maintained his full deity. But because sin... And if you go back to Psalm 22, you'll see that the reference to thou art holy, Jesus saw in that psalm right after he made that statement. He gives us the reason in Psalm 22 for thou art holy. That when the, that when the, when the sins of the world were being placed upon the sinless Son of God, that there was a break in fellowship. There was a break in fellowship between God the Father and God the Son. And think about what a painful thing that must have been for Christ to have to endure he who had known fellowship with his Father from all eternity past as he became sin for us who knew no sin, that he was separated for that moment of time from his Father in heaven. God, as the righteous judge, had to be separated from him for he was bearing the sins of the world and the wages of sin is death. And the word death means separation. When we're Born in sin, we are dead in sin. It means that we're separated from God. So God had to separate Himself from His own beloved Son. What a horrible experience this must have been. Even though He was sinless, our sins were placed upon Him and the Father turned His back. Now think of how painful that must have been to experience that separation. I'm convinced that when Jesus was in Gethsemane prior to the cross, that he was anticipating this moment. And remember, he lay prostrate in the ground, and he was praying to his Father, and he was sweating great drops of blood, and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus realized what he was going to have to do, become the sin substitute, the sin bearer for the sins of the world. He realized that he would lose that moment of fellowship and separation with his Father. And he was in agony. He prayed three times. And then he ultimately said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he submitted. And that cup 
is the cup of God's judgment. It's the cup of God's wrath that He had to drink so that we could be forgiven and we could be redeemed. So this is what He did to reconcile us from our sins. He drank the cup of our judgment. Now, secondly, was also a cry of substitution. So I would take the position that there was indeed some kind, some way, somehow, some moment of separation, and that also it's because Jesus became a substitution for our sins. Write down Isaiah chapter 53, where Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. Jesus died for our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was sinless, but he took our sin and was judged by God the Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now again, I, I, I feel like that we can't fully fathom fully comprehend or fully understand this transaction that was happening on the cross. But it's pictured all through the Bible, Genesis 22, when Abraham offered up Isaac and God stopped him from killing his son on the altar. Remember what happened? All Isaac was taken off the altar and God directed Abraham to a ram caught in the thicket in the bushes. And then he actually took Isaac off the altar, took the ram and put it on the altar in his place and killed the lamb or the ram. So that was a picture of substitution. So the heart of the cross of Christ is a substitutionary atonement of Christ. He took our place. So as we drink the cup and we eat the bread tonight, remember that this broken body and the shed blood was for you. Jesus took your place. That wrath was to be met upon you, but he took it for you so that you could be forgiven and redeemed. There's also the Passover lamb, again in Egypt, the redemption of Israel, where they slew the lamb. They took its blood. They struck it on the doorposts and lintels. And when the death angel came in, it passed over those homes where the blood was applied to the homes of the children of Israel. So his death was a substitutionary death. And then thirdly, his death was a cry of Scripture. It was a cry of Scripture. Those of you that know your Bible know well that Jesus was actually quoting when he uttered these words, Psalm 22 and verse 1. Matter of fact, you can take the 22nd Psalm and you can find all of the either direct utterances Jesus made from the cross or the background for them in Psalm 22. If you want to do something pretty exciting, take Psalm 22 and go through Psalm 22 and look for the utterances or the background for those utterances when he was hanging on the cross. Now, Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ was even born. Graphically describing death by crucifixion. And in Psalm 22, Jesus uttered the same words that the psalmist did. My God, my God, why, verse 1, hast thou forsaken me? And then in Psalm 22, verse 3, he says, For thou art holy, O thee that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So really, there's the reason why the Father forsook the Son, because he is holy. And God cannot fellowship with sin as he became our sin substitute. It's interesting, the verse 46, the word forsaken, is in what's called the aorist tense, so it means it happened at a certain moment in time, but that it has an effect forever after in history. So Jesus died once for all for the sins of the world, and he doesn't die a second time, but those who believe in him can be forgiven and spared the wrath and the judgment of God. Now, if you are a Christian, God will never, ever, ever judge you for your sin in this sense because you have been forgiven You've been adopted. You've been reconciled into the family of God. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. I'm so glad this verse is in the Bible. What does it say? There is now therefore no 
condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. The verse stops right there. For you that are in Christ Jesus, you've been born again, you've been forgiven of your sins, you've trusted Him as your Savior. The Holy Spirit has come to take up residence in your heart. You're a child of God. There is no condemnation because you are in Christ Jesus. So Jesus died in your place. Jesus, the Lamb, was substituted for you on the cross. Now there's no condemnation. And then Romans chapter 8 ends in verse 38 and 39, where Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor principalities, powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing, that's pretty all-inclusive, shall be able to what? Separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Think about it. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross in my place. I can't, I can't fathom it all. I can't, I can't take it in. Why would He die for me? Even while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. Why would He reconcile me? Why would He adopt me? Why would He forgive me? Why would He make me His very own child? Love of God greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It's God's love. It's God's grace. It's God's mercy. It's God's kindness. So as we break this bread tonight, we drink this cup tonight, I pray that the Spirit of God would move in our midst and move on our hearts and help us to fully enter into the horrible blackness and darkness of what Christ had to experience on that cross. And that separation from the Father because He took my sin, He took your sin. He carried it away so that we could be forgiven and we would have no condemnation. No condemnation, no separation. For Christ died in my place. Amen? Let's pray.